this session in which we'll be talking about women in data and I'd like to introduce you to our panel who are going to take us through some of the, uh, the issues, objectives and um, success stories uh, about bringing women into this industry and helping them to thrive. Uh, so from your right we have Alison Now from um, Test, what was the second one? Test, Learn, Iterate. Sorry about that. I, I literally only learned that one. Test, Learn, Iterate. Then we have uh, Lynn Pope from St. James Place Wealth Management. Uh, in the middle, we have Lucy Fox from Cloudera, who are the sponsors for this session. You can go and see them outside afterwards. Uh, then we have Rachel Keane and Rasheen McCarthy from Data Tech, who are the co-founders of the Women in Data event and community. I'm David Reed. I am the Knowledge and Strategy Director at DataIQ, and we have been following and furthering the issue of diversity and the events of women in data as strongly as possible. And so we thought the best place to start with a session like this is to actually ask the question, well, why talk about women in data? So to address that, uh, we have a little video. Um, we'd like to show you someone who has some views. folks. That was a false start. <laughs> oh. If it doesn't go this time, we'll, we'll skip it. Yeah. If not, we'll, we'll just go past. All right. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. All right. Um, <coughs> Rachel, I think you know what they were saying in that video. Do you want to give us a quick Sally, sense? half of all young women never consider a career in STEM. From data science to data engineering, women are still underrepresented in all areas of data and technology. The situation is ripe for change. Women have so much to offer the data and technology industry. Our perspective is needed. showcase of women. It's created to inspire future generations of women in data and technology to aim higher and press further. These 20 women work in a range of industries. They've had an incredible impact in the organisations they're involved with. They've invented game-changing technologies. They are changing our world for the better. Many are leading their professions. Others are just at the start of their careers. All of these women are making an incredible difference. They deserve to be recognised for what they've achieved. At the female lead, we know you can't be what you can't see. So this is a very real, very live issue. Um, and as you'll see, if I can get on to the, the next slide, um, there are genuine challenges um, in terms of, oops. Why has that gone ahead of me? Right. Um, let's, let's get some views from the panel about why we should be thinking about women in data in particular, um, why gender is a dimension that we need to consider in terms of recruitment and career development. Um, so as the founders of Women in Data, Rasheen, Rachel, would you like to just give a sense of why you started where you started? Yeah, for sure, David. Thank you um, for the intro. Sorry about the technical issues there. But um, Rachel and I 
co-founded Women in Data in 2015. What was evident was women were leaving the industry in their droves, and we decided to do something about it. We went out to industry, we looked at the research, and we looked at why this was happening. And what was evident was there was not enough role models, first and foremost, and there wasn't opportunities for women to progress their careers. So we decided to do something about it. And uh, three years ago, Rachel and I had 125 women in our community. We now have 20,000 women. And we're hosting our flagship event on the 29th of November. With 1,000 female data practitioners, which actually was the key bit of information in that sentence, Roisin. So just going back to Roisin's point, of course, as, as, as data recruiters ourselves, we're always looking at our stats, obviously male and female. Um, but what was really interesting is actually it was 51% of women that year that were coming through from numerical subjects um, at bachelor level and obviously 49% for males and we obviously 10 or 15 years into our career feel that you know we're recruiting across every single level of seniority but we'd only place 2% of women in a, you know over 150,000 pounds so we obviously wanted to know where these women were going but equally what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a community that ensured that we kept hold of these ladies that we retained them in the data um, industry and that we ensured that we invested some development with them. Um, so, uh, Lynn and Lucy, you both work in the technology space, or come up through the technology space. Um, could you give us a, a feeling for the uh, diversity or otherwise, uh, the presence of women in the workplace and what for you the challenges have been? Yeah, so, um, can anyone hear me? Because I, yeah, good. So I was one of those 125 women at that first event and it's been really great to see how much that's grown to the size it has now and everybody I see I, I, especially women in my team I'll go register for this register for this it's great just to go and talk to other people in a comfortable environment about data um, for myself and, and we talked about women in data and why we should do it if, if I look back 20 years and 20 years was it seems I feel really old now um, there were no female role models not, not really not for me at the time and they're all male ro role models um, I didn't even think about it. It wasn't a thing, actually, until about eight years ago I was asked to present um, about women in digital technology, and I started looking back and thinking, actually, I was really lucky. I always had women in my team and around me. But when I sort of thought about it, it was like, but that was six women out of 60 in the whole IT department. So I'm from an engineering background. I'm from DevOps and that kind of stuff. So I was in IT. Um, so I think, for me, it's about role models. I have two, two daughters, um, as, well as, a, as well as a son. Um, and it's about just um, making us available so people can kind of chat to us and see it's quite possible to move, have a career in data. And paths are a lot more defined now. It's a lot, lot easier. I've been in data science the last couple of years, and it's, the amount of women coming from, from that area has grown an awful lot. I don't know what your experience is. What, yeah. yeah, so I've been in uh, IT sales for over, over 20 years. Um, and, and likewise, didn't really think about it. Uh, was very male-dominated. I was always the only woman in the team. Um, so it, you get kind of used to it and a little bit numb to it, and it seems accepted. What I think I've noticed and what's been really exciting is to see that it's become a topic that we can talk about now, that actually we are... Uh, we are one voice, but actually that one voice has got bigger and has grown, and we can actually have communities where we can share and talk and see role models and actually be able to have those available to us. I've had some fantastic mentors through my entire career, but it is something about having um, a female community as well that can help and can help give you some guidance as well and give you something to look up to. And for me, I'm very mindful of it's not necessarily about me anymore. It's about how everybody in and around me and how to make their, their roles move faster and to be seen and to be heard quicker. And Alison, as a consultant going into many organizations, um, what view does that give you about uh, diversity and presence of women? I think for me, I've, uh, you know, a bit like Lucy, I've, I've normally been the only woman on, um, on the team. Um, in one instance, I was the first woman um, that a startup had hired um, and they were, you know, excited about that, but also a bit nervous around how that might change dynamics. And, you know, I think things have, have evolved since then. My most recent permanent position, I was the managing director of, of a, a data division, which I, I set up for a large company in the, the automotive sector. And so you have the, the data and technology and automotive piece, which meant um, that my team was pretty much all men with, with one or two exceptions. Um, and I see that some of the use of women in data, you know, there's, I, I do tend to see more women in retail data, for example. Um, or in beauty and data um, than women in um, 
some of the more technical fields or some of the fields that we typically are, 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 are associated with men, such as automotive, for example. And prior to that, I worked in insurance, which wasn't quite as bad, but still was, was quite heavily, heavily skewed towards men. And so I don't think it's just about being in data, because there's, there's lots of women in the room, and there's some men here, so thank you for joining us. Um, but I think it's also about what is the application of that, um, which is really important and, and helps to drive um, what people's interest is. So um, part of the purpose for Women in Data, as we heard, is to um, inspire and encourage women and also to uh, uh, indicate what needs to happen to increase um, uh, the appeal of the data industry to women. Um, Rachel, you were, you were sharing something uh, about how early, perhaps, we can start on that journey. You were, you were actually talking about coding toys. Okay, so... Um I was on uh, the telephone to somebody yesterday talking about this panel session, actually. Um, and she has a daughter who's seven, and she was getting very excited about the fact that John Lewis had uh, created this range of STEM toys where her six, seven, even four-year-old could start coding. Um, and interestingly, I have a 15-year-old daughter who has just taken her options. And last year, I found out that she was doing programming in Python, and I was completely beside myself with excitement. I was like, oh, my God, I can get her a job. This would be amazing. And I was like, what, would you like it? No. What do you mean? It's really boring. And then yesterday, I thought to myself, actually, the connection between those two age groups, so if maybe those toys had been available, maybe if she'd learned in that environment where she wasn't worried about what she was wearing, what she looked like, or who she was hanging around with, rather than waiting until she got to senior school, maybe that journey for her might have been different. So I think what we're doing right now, obviously encouraging girls and, and, and even boys to continue their journey with STEM, I think it's going to be so much easier now that we have that integrated into the kind of the education system, but equally into when they're playing as well. Um, but, you know, let's, that's where we need to encourage these people to come into. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are encouraging figures, I think, about the increase in the number of women studying STEM subjects. And, of course, the government is encouraging um, studying maths to, uh, to 18. Um, so we're seeing less dropout. Uh, Rasheen, by the time uh, hopefully those inspired... Um, uh, women are, are starting to come into the workplace. What should employers be doing to make the roles appeal to female candidates sure. equally um, as they do to, to men? Yeah, I think firstly, from a commercial point of view, we've got a skills shortage here in the UK. It's a fact. Many of you in the room are probably trying to hire qualified data scientists, analysts, statisticians, etc. Doesn't matter about gender, we've got a skills gap. What we do need to do as, as a um, industry base is we need to capitalize on this untapped talent. And by the ways and means we're going about it at the moment, and Rachel and I do do this as a day job, we're not being effective um, as an industry. We need to make it more attractive. We need to sell the benefits, the softer benefits of being a data practitioner for the organizations we work for. We also need to really ensure that we are getting equal talent pools coming through the process. If you've got a, a shortlist that is only men only, you're going to hire a man. It's a given. So we need to ensure that we're attracting these women to the job adverts in the first place. And they need to start by writing them differently, David, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, job ads can be um, very off-putting. There's a lot of studies that show if you just list out skills, uh, you will tend to get uh, male candidates more strongly. Whereas if you talk about the, the role and what it involves and the potential outputs, you get a much more uh, balanced flow and there are actually online tools you can check your recruitment ads um, for possible gender bias so they're worth worth looking at um, Lucy we were talking um, earlier about how to make the workplace itself um, appealing uh, and reflect the fact that uh, women in the workplace do experience different pressures and we'll come on to that in a little bit uh, so what about smart working isn't that a good way of getting a better balance not just for women I guess but for everybody but women in particular yeah, I, th I think that's a, a strong way forward and agree it's not just for women, it's, it's, it's across the board because having that means that it becomes the norm within an organisation, um, it doesn't mean that they've got separation or that any d different work groups being treated differently um, and I think it's becoming more common in, in, out there in the workplace as well and certainly more accepted across, across all businesses. Uh, Lynn, have you uh, seen that, you know, having worked in the sort of engineering side of the industry, um, the, the cliche, obviously, is of uh, guys in uh, uh, sweaty T-shirts hunched over screens. Um, that's not the, the stereotype. I said it, yeah, I said it was, yeah. Uh, um, not necessarily the most appealing uh, place, place to work, but it doesn't have to be like that, does it? Uh, no, I, I'm really quite fortunate, actually. I've, I've always worked in organisations that have been flexible for 
for everybody, um, or, you know, men and, and women. Um, and actually, where I've just I've just literally started a new role on Monday, um, and th th that is a lot of what it's about. The culture there it's about the culture for everybody, not specifically for women. But it, they talk about the softer benefits, the, the smart working that you're talking about, the team culture, all of those types of things. And actually, that is what attracted me to the role. You know, I could go out and get another role in a very technical discipline. I could do some of that, but actually, it was the culture that and the conversation I had and everything was just a nice conversation and that's why I ended up going going for that role anyway so yeah and now in in your consulting role is it part of the the conversations that you have with your client base um, some I think you know one of the real benefits is when you think about results driven workplaces and flexible working you know it, it isn't just about women and if you if the language that's used to talk about those policies are in the context of working mums and that sort of thing it can end up creating separation um, and some I'm seeing head nods, so people understand what I'm talking about. Um, well, actually, you say it's flexible working; it's for everyone. And you know, with one, one place that I was at, um, there was a guy who had two autistic children. Um, he was a single father, and he took advantage of that flexible working policy for his his personal situations, and it didn't have anything to do with gender. And by having that policy not be gender specific and not described in gender specific terms, made it more open and um, able to be accepted by everyone. Yeah, I think that um, uh, employers still tend to have slightly stone age thinking about what happens when uh, uh, a woman has a child, but they don't tend to reflect on what happens when a man has a child. Um, we were, again, discussing um, the, the effects of um, uh, having that flexible working uh, for, for men as well as women. How do you, um, how do you get past that fear factor uh, that, that women can have that if they choose to have a family, they will lose their job. I think, Rachel, you were talking about some really positive examples of where uh, employees have chosen to be far more flexible and far more progressive in their thinking. Absolutely. I think, I think actually that there's two sides to that. I think if you're a young mum, you worry that you won't have a career. And then if you are a slightly maturer mum, you worry that actually everything that you've just spent the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years working for is going to be gone or somebody's going to take it while you're away. And, and there's lots of hormones, of course, running around your body when you're doing this. So it's none of this makes any complete sense at the time. But what's really important, I think, is um, regardless of anyone's situation, and I've got actually a, a good example here about um, a couple of companies that I've worked for where women have been um, pregnant and literally just announced that they're going to be pregnant and have been promoted, um, one of which was uh, to uh, director on the first pregnancy, the second one was to MD, which was pretty exciting. Um, and from their point of view, they were really, really surprised that they had been promoted because they thought, actually, you know, I'm going to lose everything now. But from the employer's point of view, both of which I've spoken to in the run-up to this session today, were very much uh, very open thinkers and said, actually, we need to think about longer term. This person's been here X, Y, Z time. This is what they've given us value. And actually, it's very short-term thinking if we're thinking that for only six or nine or 12 months, they're going to be you know, out of the room. Um, I think also there's a lot of keep in touch days. But one of the things that Roisin and I encounter from a recruitment perspective is the people that feel very vulnerable while they're away. So maybe there's two keep in touch days. Maybe it's about um, maybe, you know, actually allowing the baby to come in or maybe, you know, to have some online courses or again, working smartly. So uh, when they're at home and they're online, maybe they can be um, involved in sort of conference calls and meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rasheen, I don't know if you want to add to that about, uh, I guess the value of the domain knowledge that practitioners build up, why cut that out of the company just because someone is choosing to have a family? Well, it's, it's nuts, actually, David, because um, our own research, and we've seen it visibly, women do tend to be more loyal in the data space with their job commitment. So if they step out of the business for a year, if they return to the business, they're more likely to stay up to four years longer than the average guy. So the investment there is, is, is clearly worthwhile. Um, yeah, the, the domain knowledge is, you invest so hard as an organization, as an employer, to increase that, to develop that. It doesn't go away with a year out of the business. It doesn't disappear, but actually technology changes at such a speed that you do need to ensure, and women are very, very conscious of this, returning to the workplace, especially if they're coding, if they're hands-on in what they're doing, have they missed a trick? So we've got to ensure that we're giving them the opportunity to upskill whilst they're off. 
and they will take it. We know women will take those opportunities. Come to women and data. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Come to women and data. It, it happens. <laughs> Okay, well, let's imagine that we have managed to create this ideal workplace, that we have a progressive employer, I know, a dreamland, but uh, let's, let's try for this. Um, so those barriers to entry, those barriers to retention don't exist. Um, to circle back to the question of why talk about women in data, do we think there are skills, uh, ways of working, ways of thinking that um, are different and are particularly advantageous to the data and tech industries? Um, Alison, I'm sure you... So I think the most important thing is, is thinking about the implications for what is being developed. How are algorithms being developed? How are various tools that are capturing data being developed? I think you know, one of the things was um, Apple's health app didn't first, um, its first release um, left off monthly cycles for women, which is probably one of the most important things for women you know, between the ages of... It goes 51% of the users. Well, exactly, yeah. at, at a pretty key demographic. And so unless you've got diversity in teams that are able to think about things that are relevant and important to them, products are going to end up getting released and the, you know, as there's more automated decisioning that happens, you know, people are going to be funneled down particular routes that reinforce um, particular stereotypes and beliefs um, if those teams don't include women or people from other backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good Lynn, question oh, for the audience actually, David. Yeah. Does anybody have anything to share that they think is innovative and in the way that their employers are approaching things because we want to hear about it. Yeah. Put your hand up if you're, you're experiencing good practice in the workplace, or if you want to share bad practice, and we won't, won't name you. Let me do the mic running. Um, at DHL, we have Red Chair Network, which is basically, um, I was talking to these guys earlier about, it's a network of women within the organization driving um, for visibility and for change within the organization. Um, what I have done today is engage with these guys about bringing women and data into that as well, so I'll put, uh, catch up with you later on that one. Um, so that's been a really positive thing. It's um, about presentations, lunch and learns, and then driving the HR agenda as well. And about, like you said, not making things gender specific, um, making policies universal uh, for everyone there. Thank you for showing that example. We had someone down at the front. Hi. Hi. Um, so like these ladies, um, I work in recruitment, and we've also done a lot of similar studies. And I think one thing that we found when we did a study this year was more so that a lot of companies understand that diversity is really important and diversity in technology is in, really important and you know the majority of the organization from top to bottom get it but I think we found that there's a real real lack of people actually understanding why it's important and understanding like the studies and the research as to yes more diversity is great but what does that actually mean to like the bottom line and the business impact so I think that's one thing that kind of surprised us a little bit is that a lot of people were just doing diversity for diversity's sake and that the gaps were actually, even if they had the best diversity programs in the world and, and loads of promotion around it, it was actually, unless they actually all understood the empirical research as to why, then there'd always be a gap. So yeah, kind of that's what I want to share. We found that quite interesting. Thank you. Hi there. Um, in Computer Centre, where I work, um, we had uh, the CRN Awards, and we had a lot of nominees from Computer Center uh, that went to that, and a few winners. And that was highly promoted across our organization. But the really sad thing is that it's actually caused a problem in that it's gone the other way, in that why are you only focusing on women now? Like, and it's actually pushing people further away from wanting to be diverse. I don't know. Um, what you guys would do about that? <laughs> um, I think that's a really good point, and I think it's something that we really need to be mindful of, because it's great. I, I do think we've got a long way to go until we can get to the equality that we're looking for. However, we don't want to do that by alienating another group, and that's something we are hugely mindful of. Certainly, the organisation I work at. I, you know, th this was the first company at Cloudera that I joined that was very open about diversity and open about women in business. It was the first organisation in all the years I've been working in IT that this, is, this had come along. But when you're in a very, very large organisation or the company's very big, it, it's, it's easy to be a certain group. When you're smaller, it can be 
can divide. So it's really making sure it's open to everybody, I think is the main thing. That's, that's something that we, we're very encouraging. And, and what I found really amazing is how many of the, the men that I work with uh, are really, really promoting this. They're really keen on it, they're not excluded, they can absolutely intend anything, and we ask them to, are interested in an opinion. Um, and it's surprising how they are pushing the, the, the views, probably sometimes stronger than I am. So, you know, it's, it's uh, but you're right, I think we need to be mindful of that got a quick point there as well. Um, one of the things that Roshi and I, and I have been promoting uh, for Women in Data and also, you know, just in our personal lives is the question to ask is how many people are mentoring or mentees in your business? So if you've got sort of one gap and the other gap, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, obviously we're doing Women in Data, but that's not to say that we will only talk to um, the ladies that approach us about getting mentors to just women. You know, there are millions and millions of guys that we say actually this is a great fit for what you're looking for or you know the, the kind of level that you're looking at so I would suggest that actually you get a mentoring program that is completely mixed um, where you get that common denominator between the two of you because your love is data that's your common denominator the difference is one's a guy and one's a female you just need to re re unite and um, I think when you share advice and examples you, you know you get that kind of respect back Hi. Um, just in terms of bringing in different viewpoints, um, I work for a small organisation. We're a membership group for dietitians, which is one of the few medical professions that's actually female dominated. It's currently about 94% female workforce. Um, but for my job as a data officer, that, and it's a new job in the company, I was the only non-male applicant. And I was told afterwards that I got the job because I was the only applicant with a background in administration and business processes who could bring that all-round view and I think um, certainly for me personally I'm actually from an arts background everything I know about data I've learned on the job um, and they said none of the male applicants most of whom were straight out of university had anything other than pure data in their mind and I'm not sure if that is a particularly female related trait but I just think it's something to think about. Yeah, I think just firstly on that, there is the 80-20 the rule that Rachel and I have um, seen roll out pretty regularly over the last three, four years. Um, whereas women will think that they have 80% of the, the skills for a job and they won't apply. Men will have 20% of the skills for the job and they'll apply. Um, so actually, you know, they've applied for the job and actually they won't cut out from it for what you were saying there. <laughs> in, in, yeah, okay, so th that is really, really regular to see, and we're seeing it more and more, but actually bringing together other skill sets and viewpoints is so vital. Rachel and I see it all the time. Taking a, a graduate from psychology and using their, their consumer behavior skills, using their numeracy as well, and creating an analytical career path for them is a really natural thing to do, but if they don't see it on a job description, they don't apply. So it's really transforming the way that people are presenting things again and ensuring that they are attracting people for the best person for the job, but it doesn't have to be a list of skills. It really doesn't. And, and you're a great example of that, so thank you. And I was just, say, just to add on to that, I think there's a lot of focus on STEM and what we forget, or, or even STEAM, and the arts I think are fantastic, yeah. but what we oftentimes forget is the social sciences who are right. trained in the scientific method to take very fuzzy concepts that are almost impossible to quantitatively define, yet are still tasked with how do you measure this, how do you think about that? So you think about economics, psychology, sociology, ethnography, political science, etc. I think there's a whole sector of people that come out of university that have those skills and that interest, but don't think that becoming a data scientist or a data analyst applies to them. When actually the foundation and application of the same sorts of techniques makes them prime candidates for, for entering the field. For sure. Okay, well amazingly, we're starting to run out of time and we feel like we've only just started to scratch this surface. I think we're due to finish at 20 past. Um, so just as a, as a final wrap up, could I get a, a comment from each of you, circling back to the question of women in data, do we feel there's a horizon line when we no longer have to talk about this? And what would need to happen to make that happen? Okay, well, Rachel and I set out on this journey thinking that we'd get it done in a couple of years. We're, we're wrong, we accept that. <laughs> um, but I think it's closer than we think, David. But one thing is absolutely imperative, we've got to do it together. Men and women on this journey, this is not excluding, this is inclusion. And um, that's very much what Women in Data stand for.
I think I've got one line really, and I think diversity is necessary and inclusion is a choice. And uh, going back to Roisin's point, everybody kind of works together and respects each other and, and takes advice from each other and includes you know, some of the social sciences and, and the art, um, the STEAM uh, factor. I think, I think we've, we're going to get there. Yeah, I think that's key. It's diversity. And I think the Women in Data has kick-started that. But actually, it's a bigger topic about diversity and data. Um, and we're just, start, we're just really starting, just starting something and scratching the surface with that, really. Um, I would say that uh, what has been done to get us where we are today, I think, has been phenomenal. I think it's everybody who shares this, this interest, shares this belief, and also wants to do something about it all stand up and, and be counted for and also help help spread the messages and work together uh, and that's across all diversity uh, men women everybody that's got this passion let's all work together to make a difference i agree <laughs> okay um thank you everybody please thank our panel thank you. and apologies that the slide deck didn't work <laughs> <laughs>